Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our, 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 our second to last uh, colloquium of the, of the season, the uh, last one before last one before Thanksgiving. Uh, thanks, thank you for so many, so many people making time out of this this uh, afternoon to do this. It's, uh, 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 it's, I guess it doesn't really mean anything that a lot of people are going uh, uh, since we're all right where we usually are, at least at least, at least I am. Uh, today, we're very happy to have, uh, speaking for us, the only man who's still the only man who's ever bought a foreign head of state to speak to the Kinder Institute. Uh, so therefore, uh, one, one who deserves a, 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 great, a great deal of honor, uh, uh, Professor Dave Dunkley. Uh, uh, a lot of you probably, a lot of you probably know Dave, so I'm, I will, I will keep this, I will keep this brief. Uh, Dave's associate professor of uh, Black Studies uh, and History here at, here, here at Mizzou. Um, uh, I actually forgot to count how long he's been here, but we've, uh, 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 and we've, uh, and there's a work not just in Bring Ford has stayed, worked together on a number of number of things and Dave's been a great friend of the of the Kinder Institute uh, and uh, so we're glad to have him uh, give this talk he's a uh, author of uh, agency of the enslaved to Jamaica Jamaica and the culture of freedom in the Atlantic world from uh, 2014 uh, uh, Leonard Percival Howell the genesis of Rastafari uh, from 2015 uh, and he and uh, Stephanie Shonekin edited Black Resistance in America in the Americas from 2019, uh, and a number of other articles and projects. And the other thing is that if he, Dave was supposed to be uh, leading leading uh, one of our uh, our uh, one of our Oxford uh, study abroad courses this last summer, uh, which obviously did not happen, but hopefully we'll get to, to hopefully someday uh, he'll get to do that. Uh, Dave is uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the I think is a, a leading historian of, of of slavery in the Atlantic world, and today he's also uh, he's also uh, a, he's I, I don't know I, and I guess sort of of of, reli of of religion and slavery to to in, across a number of and across across a, across a number of in this Jamaica more generally. Uh, today, Dave's going to speak on uh, um, Anglican evangelism and the maintenance of slavery in the 18th century Atlantic world, uh, unless unless he's changed his title, which I'll let him decide. Which which I'll which I'll, I'll let him decide. So thanks, Dave. Now you, if you w welcome, uh, and I guess before I before I get started, every as usual, uh, if you've got questions, uh, please submit them in the chat. Uh, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll call on you and bring you up uh, when it, when it's time to ask them. Uh, uh, also, uh, I I personally think that you know if you don't have dogs or people yelling behind you, you can you know, by all means keep keep you can mute your microphones. But if you want to laugh, you know if you personally if you want to keep them on and and laugh or clap, you know spontaneous applause is always welcome. Uh, so uh, let's turn it over to Dave. Thank you very much. Um... Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, so I, I need to share the screen and it's giving me uh, some kind of message uh, we, that it's the uh, same. We need to uh, all participate, hang on. You should be able to now, I think. Is it still, there you go. Okay. All right. So, first of all, thank you very much for that um, for that introduction. I, uh, you know, I was when you when when Jeff first asked me to make this presentation, I was a bit hesitant because usually those of us who are doing work on religious uh, groups tend to have an audience that's not very very big. The the audience is usually people who specialize in the field. Which is unfortunate because the, the religion plays such an important role in the lives of most people, I think. And 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 even even to this day, we we are we are confronted with 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 that um, the importance of religion in people's lives. Uh, so I, I agreed to do it because 
I think that this particular um, religious body, the Church of England, played such a large role in the shaping of, of social uh, and political life in the Americas that it, 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 you know, it's unfortunate that um, it hasn't received that kind of attention from um, a wide cross section of, of, of the society. Even though the, 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 the church itself, which is called the Episcopal Church in the, Uni in the context of the United States, accounts for quite a large, still accounts for quite a large congregation of the church going um, population of the country. So with, with that said, I did decide to kind of modify the title a bit because I wanted not to, to be restricted to the, 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 um, the 18th century. Uh, I, I think that there, there, are, there are a few characters in the, in the 17th century that I wanted to talk about. So I decided to include a bit of this, the, the 17th century and um, a bit of the early 18th century. So I, I just simply watered it down to Anglicanism and slavery in the Atlantic world. Okay, so a bit about the project in general. So th this presentation is a small part of a larger project for a monograph on the Anglican church and its suppression of the resistance to slavery by the enslaved people in British America. And I use British America here to include the Caribbean um, and the colonies in, well, the colony on the South American continent and British Honduras, which is Belize today. The project begins in the 16th century um, with England's involvement in the transatlantic uh, slave trade through the activities of John Hawkins. And I examine the church's role in these early slave trafficking ventures along with its involvement in the English colonial project in the Americas. And among the main contributors, um, among the main contributors to this project were the Anglican clergymen, Richard Hacklot and Samuel Purchas, whom um, some people might have heard of. And I use publications by these two clergymen from um, 1584 to 1625 to discuss the church's conceptualizations of race and class and their influence on the ways in which the church attempted to support English colonialism and slavery in the 17th and 18th um, centuries. Because of the sheer um, volume of information, which is something new to me coming out of Rastafari studies um, in the <laughs> early years, <laughs> finding more than I actually need is <laughs> it's, it's very refreshing, but, but it's quite, um, um, it can be quite hectic at times. So because of the sheer volume of information on the church's involvement in slavery in the Americas, I'm not yet um, sure that the study itself will, will terminate at the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade in 1807 as, as originally planned. It's not clear, it's, it's now clear to me that ending the study at that point would mean cutting the discussion of the mass baptism of the enslaved people that the church undertook after 1797 as part of an amelioration project that extended slavery with the promise of freedom. Among the main contributors to this amelioration um, um, project were the prominent, prominent clergymen, Bilby Porteous, the, uh, a Bishop of London after 1787, and James Ramsey, who was a rector in the colony of the Caribbean colony of St. Kitts. I think it was 1772 until um, certainly about 17, 17, um, 78 or something like that. So both have been appropriately discussed as important contributors to the British movement to abolish the slave trade that began around the 1780s. But my assessment of their writings focuses on their use of the promise of freedom at an unspecified date to Christianize or moralize slavery, while waiting on the planter class to develop the confidence that they could abolish slavery without jeopardizing the profitability of the plantation system. Scholars tend to infer that Porteous and Ramsey were supporters of abol abol abolishing both the slave trade and slavery, but their promise of freedom makes 
their description as abolitionists of slavery problematical. Furthermore, in 1808, Porteus himself rejected the offer to join a subsequent campaign to abolish slavery after witnessing the parliamentary decision to end the slave trade. He rejected the offer to work towards ending slavery itself on the grounds that the campaign was, quote, injudicious to the planters and enslaved people. Needless to say, Porteus did not believe that the immediate or universal abolition of slavery was in the best interest of the British Empire, not without guarantees from the enslaved people that they would adhere to the hierarchies of race and class developed during slavery, in addition to supporting British colonial rule. Porteus and Ramsey, quite frankly, argued for a different kind of mastery by the planter class and for the unlikely development of perpetual black submission to this master. This was partly why it became so critical, uh, I, I try to um, bring out in the, in the larger work. Um, this was why it became, partly why it became so critical to end the resistance by the enslaved. Uh, a suppression envisaged using the catechism of the church. The future mastery of the planter class was expected to maintain the white domination of the colonial societies and their dependence on black labor power, with the formerly enslaved people expected to remain as the chief manual laborers of these societies. So that is the general thrust of the, the larger project. And I should add that it includes some personalities that my American audience might be more familiar with, namely um, Benjamin. Benjamin Franklin. He, he, he's included because he had a, a surprisingly intimate relationship with the Anglican Church through the, the Society for the Associates of um, Dr. Thomas Bray, who is part of my discussion today. He was integral to the effort to squash resistance by the enslaved people in British America using Anglican catechism. And Franklin documented his own efforts in this regard, principally in his support of um, separate or segregated schooling for black children before the American War of Independence. He also continued to promote this type of schooling in the early Republic. But I digress. Uh, Franklin is very, very interesting. Um, that's probably for another talk. Um, for today's presentation, I want to shed some light on the catechism promoted by Morgan Godwin and Thomas Bray, two prominent Anglican clergymen in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. So let's start with um, Morgan Godwin. Now, Morgan, I, I call this section um, Godwin and the Fruits of Fidelity, um, which I extract from, I extracted from his, his actual, um, one, of his, one, of his, one of his major um, pieces of writing. In 1680, Anglican clergyman Morgan Godwin publicly went on record as an avid promoter of baptizing enslaved people as a means to their pacification in his um, book, The Negroes and Indians Advocate. Godwin gave assurances to the planter class of Barbados and Virginia that instruction and baptism of the enslaved people in the doctrine and discipline of the Church of England would prevent their resistance to slavery. He made a similar recommendation that proposed to stop the resistance of indentured servants, but envisaged their release from indentured service after periods ranging from four to seven years as their contracts duly specified. Essentially, Godwin took an imperialistic approach to religion guided by the perspective that Anglo-Protestantism was the only true religion and the only means to true spiritual uplift. In addition, Godwin assured the planters that Anglican instruction and baptism would discourage the enslaved people from thinking of themselves as equals of the planters or any whites. Assurances Godwin gave using popular Anglican interpretations of the King James Bible at the time. Godwin used, for example, um, and the, the, the churchgoers among us would recognize some of, <laughs> probably recognize the scripture. The, the um, St. Paul's letters to the Corinthians, which states in part, 
Let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Godwin used this quote to show the kind of scriptures that would be taught to the enslaved people. Scriptures given pro-slavery interpretations that presented slavery as a civilizing institution for Africans. As such, slavery was presented as not only a benefit to the plant, but as granting the enslaved people access to heaven. <laughs> Similarly, uh, similar to other Anglican clergymen in the colonies at the time, Godwin promised that baptizing the enslaved people would allow the planter to, quote, recap the desired fruit of his servant's fidelity, unquote. Addressing the enslaved people who wanted to run away from slavery or pursue money mission, Godwin also asserted that any of them inclined to, quote, running away or buying his freedom would be dissuaded by instruction and baptism in the church. In a 1681 supplement to his book, and I should say that this supplement has been, I, I don't know why, but nobody focuses on this supplement. It's short, it's easy, it's easier to read than the, this magnum opus that he published in the previous year. And the supplement kind of captures the essence of what he was trying to say. So in this, in this um, 1681 supplement to his book, Godwin also proposed an English law to confirm that the planters had, quote, a secure and just interest in their slaves. And he suggested this law, he added, for the enslaved people to thereby be continued in their present state of servitude, notwithstanding their being afterward baptized. This, the, the story so far sounds pretty straightforward, but it gets a bit complicated when you start reading the secondary literature. And the secondary, secondary literature on Godwin is not, does not tell the kind of story that I just told you. It's actually quite the opposite. Godwin's criticisms of the conduct of slavery. <laughs> Jeff, I'm hearing some, ba some background noise. Okay, good. So Godwin's criticisms of the conduct of slavery encouraged British abolitionists, um, namely Thomas Clarkson, to consider him as one of the first learned British subjects to contribute to the cause of abolition. But Clarkson focused only on Godwin's criticisms of the conduct of slavery, ignoring his recommendations about encouraging the slaves to accept enslavement through Anglo-Protestant catechism. Important to remember is that Clarkson looked to history to remind the British of their Christian enlightenment, the, the Reformation, to make his case for the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. Clarkson wrote, for example, and you have it there, Providence seems to have appointed those, and he was speaking of Godwin as one of those, who devote themselves most to, this, to his service, to the honorable office of becoming so many agents under his influence for the correction of the evils of life, unquote. My, my take on this is that Clarkson gave a political reading of English history, particularly the history of colonialism and slavery in the 17th century. He was clearly a masterful tactician and propagandist of the 18th century abolition campaign. And he inspired both British and American abolitionists to adopt a similar reading of England's colonial history. At this point, I am, um, at this point, I am inclined to mention that the prominent historian of um, slavery and freedom in the US, um, the, the late D David Brian Davis, um, seems to have subscribed to Clarkson's reading of English colonial history, as Davis used Clarkson's remarks on Godwin to also observe. Providence had evidenced an ecumenical spirit by selecting such representative agents of abolition as Morgan Goodwin, unquote. And you recognize the language is also similar to that of, um, of Clarkson. Another admirer of Clarkson's interpretation or reading of English colonial history was Frederick Douglass, 
the black abolitionist and former slave. Douglas and Clarkson were similar on many levels. Both understood the powerful role that religion and its moral standards could play in abolition. And both used history to shame their nations into abolition by making the point that many British people objected to slavery from its beginning. Douglas used his um, telling of this history to make the point that the British people who opposed slavery in Godwin's time were the ancestors of the white Americans who refused to relinquish slavery in his time. Douglas agreed that Godwin was one of the um, conscientious objectors, let's call it that, who opposed slavery. Douglas wrote some very flattering comments about um, Godwin, ignoring, I think, the latter's stance on the role of religious indoctrination in pacifying the enslaved people to continue uh, slavery. I also wonder, um, and I've been trying to figure out what to make of this, what Douglas would have said of Godwin's 1681 supplement to his book, in which Godwin proposed the passage of an English law similar to the one passed in 1680 in Maryland, a law to make the baptism of the enslaved people a condition of keeping them in slavery rather than liberating them from slavery. Perhaps Douglas knew of the supplement and therefore decided that it was, it, was, it was too problematical for his discussion of early British interests in abolition. And um, I, I make this, I, I say perhaps because I'm aware that critical to, his, to, to the discussion that Douglas um, had of Godwin, as Douglas himself confirmed, was for Godwin to be seen as, quote, a good man, unquote. All right, I'm going to turn to the next section, which is um, on Thomas Bray. And this, I call this Thomas Bray and the Enlightened Slave. In 1696, the Bishop of London at the time, Henry Compton, appointed the Reverend Dr. Thomas Bray as commissary, commissary of, um, to Maryland. Um, Compton had created the position of commissary to oversee the church and clergy in each um, colony. The commissary was kind of the manager, like the manager of the clergy in, the, in each, in each um, colony, the clergy in each colony. Bray went on to establish no fewer than, um, by one count, 50 parish and lending libraries for use by clergymen in the colonies and in 1701 started an organization, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, which I'll call SPG um, going forward. And um, its seal is on one of those pictures there right beside Bree himself. Um, so he formed the SPG to provide the catechism of the church to support the um, work of the clergy among whites, um, Native Americans and the enslaved people in the colonies. Um, its work among the enslaved people included supporting slavery by ensuring that the, um, the enslaved were instructed to respect and obey the planters. In discussing the proselytization of the enslaved people, Bray was also clear that it should be provided as part of extending Anglo-Christianity to counteract the Roman Catholic Church, which presented one of the greatest challenges for the stability of the British Empire. Bray thus advised that the civil government of England, he said, has very great reason to take umbrage to the conversion of England's slaves by Catholic priests. Bray was therefore described by later admirers, such as the um, Reverend East Apthorpe of the uh, Christ Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who, who, as, a, as a true patriot who united his views of policy with those of religion to make the British Empire into an empire of Jesus Christ. Uh, I should add that uh, Apthorpe, there's another story I tell about Apthorpe, which is very um, much a part of this story. It's the, his, his um, involvement in the so-called um, Mayhew controversy with Jonathan Mayhew, the, um, the, 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 the um, congregationalist minister who 
accused the Anglican clergy of wanting to establish an episcopate in the Americas to, 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 um, so that to, to the Church of England could exert more power in the colonies. An episcopate meaning uh, um, 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 appointment of bishops who would then have the power to ordain um, anybody they deem qualified for the, um, for the clergy. So, so, but that, so, but he was very, um, he was a great admirer of Thomas Bray, and particularly his, his comments on Bray's integration of religion and the building of 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 the, the English Empire um, is quite um, interesting. And I, I try to bring out this story in the larger work because it's important because there is a good deep body of work by people um, like Andrew Porter that the the um, Protestant missionaries were not involved in empire building. Um, certainly this was not the case with, um, with the SPG. It was an empire building institution under Thomas Bray's um, conceptualization of its work. Uh, again, I, I digress. Um, Bray was a close friend of Captain James Oglethorpe, whom you might be familiar with as a founder of colonial Georgia, and through his friendship supported Georgia's colonization without um, slave holding. Now I had to bring this in because um, it, 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 it had to be explained. Otherwise, it gave this impression that Bray was, um, was, was an abol abolitionist. Um, Bray objected to slaveholding in Georgia, as he stated, to plant a Christian colony. As part of his wish not to populate any further colonies of England with Africans, he described as, quote, sunk down to the lowness of brutes for want of knowledge of the Christian religion. His reason for opposing slavery in Georgia is important because the opposition has been used to suggest that he stood for abolishing slavery, as I said. But Bray also described Africans as unable to raise themselves, quote, above the animal life, a condition he saw as a threat to the Christian orientation of the colonies. He argued that the productivity of the existing slave colonies could be increased by Christianizing slavery, the effect of which included eliminating the need to add um, other slaveholding colonies to the empire. Bray regarded baptizing the enslaved people as a symbolic representation of, the, of their conquest by the English. This conquest was expected to eliminate any threats to the safety of the colonies and the productivity of the slaves. Uh, their subjugation by the church prevented the enslaved people from propagating their African religious and secular traditions that might destabilize the economic, social, and political order of the colonies. In his um, circular letter to the clergy of Maryland in uh, 1700, Bray advised that they should rejoice in their very hearts to behold so a mind so enlightened in bodies so dark. Guiding the clergy to regard baptizing the enslaved people as not only a way for them to enter heaven, he also suggested that baptism, he also suggested baptism as a means to the redemption of their race from African traditions. Bray suggested that these traditions stood as a threat to the empire and perceived this threat principally through the possible disruption of the plantation system of the colonies. And if there is any doubt of his, his, his investment in, 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 in slavery, He's writing in 1703 to Colonel Quarry in Maryland, advising him that he should use some money that they had for the SPG to buy cattle so that they could be um, taken care of by the enslaved people attached to one of the commissary's um, premises. Connected to his thoughts on race, but largely ignored, was Bray's insistence on policing the effective prohibition um, of any instances of interracial sex. This created the obvious outcome of procreation. Bray's police, policing of interracial sex stood as a measure to prevent the English blood from becoming connected with the African race. Bray's perception of the enslaved people through the lens of race included his effort to protect the English empire through the subjugation of the enslaved people. His conception of racial redemption for the enslaved involved claims that baptism would liberate them from the racial incivilities common to Africans. Bray further suggested that these racial traits had adversely affected their development 
as a people. The conversion to Christianity, Bray argued, would be sold to the enslaved people as having the additional advantage of helping them to obtain heavenly freedom, similar to what Godwin had been saying in the previous century. This freedom in heaven would also come as a reward for their fidelity to the slave owners. No slave was to view baptism as a route to freedom on earth. This stipulation reminds me of the rumor um, started by enslaved people that baptism would grant them freedom. Um, the similar rumors circulated in uh, South Carolina. Let me see if I can let you see what. Yes, so similar rumors circulated in South Carolina in 1709 and Virginia and Jamaica in 1730. And, and, and in Virginia, it actually resulted in some insurrections between, well, there were uh, what do they call um, rumors of insurrections in 1730 and actual insur insurrections were suppressed in 1731. The Jamaican scene um, hasn't been explored, but it, it, there were similar rumors in Jamaica in 1730 that King George would, the second would grant freedom to all the enslaved people who got baptized. Um, the, in response to the um, South Carolina incident, the, the um, Reverend Dr. Um, Francis Lejeau, um, Frenchman who becomes um, an Anglican um, um, a catechist for the, the, the SPG. Um, decided to draft a declaration to appease the planter class, as well as dissuade this enslaved people from thinking of baptism as a route to earthly freedom. Um, before they could be baptized by Lejeu, he required all adult enslaved people to agree to the following, and you have it there. You declare in the presence of God and before this congregation that you do not ask for the holy baptism out of any desire to free yourself, unquote. And this is, this is, this is the kind of uh, kind of language that you know he's not just responding to the planters out of fear of persecuting persecution from the planters, but as a standard practice of the SPG that it was not offering baptism or instruction in Christianity and slave people to free them, not by a long shot. Um, so let me let me conclude this. Uh, I, I I and um. I'm looking forward to hearing um, your questions. So I will end with a, a brief reflection on a major development for Bray's SPG in 1712, two years after the death of um, Christopher Codrington, who is depicted on that slide, Christopher Codrington III, that is, who bequeathed to the um, will to the, the, the SPG his two sugar plantations in Barbados, did Martin and Consents and their 300 enslaved people. Now, Codrington stipulated in his will that he wished, quote, um, to have the plantations continued entire and the 300 slaves at least always kept their own, unquote. It's important to note that um, Codrington considered the SPG as the best organization that could guarantee his final wishes for his plantations and enslaved people. A number of bishops also expressed their admiration for Bray for his support of slavery through the SPG. In 1711, for example, the Bishop of Asaf, um, William Fleetwood, who gained some, some, some um, popularity, I, I gather, um, delivering a sermon um, stated that the SPG had successfully shown the planters that they are, quote, neither prohibited by the laws of God nor those of the land from keeping Christian slaves and that their slaves are no more at liberty after they are baptized than they were before." Unquote. In addition, Fleetwood observed that baptism of the enslaved people makes no alteration of their condition in this world. And he stated quite frankly, the, liber the liberty of Christianity is entirely spiritual. He further asserted, Christianity and slavery, quote, certainly are things that may be tolerably reconciled, unquote. That's where I'm ending. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Dave. Let me unshare this thing. Um, well, so let's, 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 so there's, 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 there's a couple of questions. There's a couple of questions here. Um, that some, some that the people have actually, people were answering questions to themselves, I guess, uh, I guess I, Dave. I, I guess the question. Um, let, let me just start out with just an informational one because I'm not sure that I actually know. Is this so? When you're, are you revising a, 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 a view of the SPG that that's been running around among historians, or as well as the SPG themselves? The well, one one view that I'm aware of is that the there is this ongoing discussion about Protestant um, missionaries and right. uh, being um, more interested in spreading religion than in creating empire. Um, it, the discussion has included in this, this discussion is some reflection on the SPG, but it is not the focus of the, the, the work. Um, the SPG, in fact, the, the Anglican Church itself, work on it has been sort of, it's, it's, there's not a great deal of focus on its role in the world of, of slavery. Um, not since people like um, Keith Hunt and so on. There is this general impression that they supported slavery and that's the end of the story. Um, my, 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 um, what I'm trying to do is to show that the support for slavery was integral with it, to this concern about the um, enslaved people, um, about resistance, and what that meant for the future of the, the empire. Um, would they, it's not just about um, whether they were interested in abolishing slavery or they were not, but how, what kind of future would be, would these colonies have if the enslaved people um, were allowed to continue resistance, that res this resistance would grow into something bigger and disrupt the empire. There would be no empire. So, so that's that's where I come into the discussion. So, well, does it does it make a difference that the? Well, I mean, I guess I know the answer to this question. Does it, does it make a difference that the that the SPG is? Well, the SPG is part of the Ang the Church of England, and the Church of England is part of the government. Right, so, so uh, they're not going to be critics of it. I mean, so, so I guess in other words, their role supporting supporting the role supporting slavery that would sit, you just can kind of sense them almost as, you know, we're not doing anything to actually. You know, it's 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 like that's like it's like almost like some like disclaimers they were making. Yes, or that they were trying to show how they were actually being supportive as you know as part of this apparatus we are we are supporting this apparatus like a government agency. Yes, they, there was an integral partnership between the church and state, and because this was after all the established church as they yes, yes. call it. Um, but the story gets a little more complicated, um, particularly after 1780, with people like Ramsey and Porteous who are now departing from the, the, the usual narrative that let's try and convert them and moralize slavery. Because uh, Porteous and, 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 and Ramsey got involved in the campaign to abolish slavery, right? Which was, which was started outside of the government. So they're actually going against, but, but th th that story is, 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 um, tells a different part of this history because it's about, as I, as I alluded to, it's about the use of freedom and also to sort of control the unlimited power of the planter class in the colonies. Um, so they are talking about the, the promise of freedom in this context. Of course, people have discussed it in other ways. They talked about this, this um, investment in moral capital and, and so on. Um, but for me, there was, when I, when I look at the work, there is no clear cut path to freedom that is being discussed here. What is being discussed is how do we guarantee that these enslaved people maintain the bonds to the plantation system? And, and my quest, I raised some questions about that, you know, that they didn't raise, you know, how, how likely was this to happen? Uh, what about those enslaved people who had been revolting and 
showing that they did not want any attachment to a plantation system. What about the ones who would never become Christians? You know, these are important questions that were, were ignored and would. So, so that's why I use terms like immediate abolition, universal abolition, because there could be abolitions taking place, but certainly not for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I've, Dave, we list, we will, I'll, I'll talk more, but we have questions from other people now. And uh, usually we ask for a student question first, but I'm gonna say students think of a question and you ask it second because uh, Professor Sexton says he needs says says he's on the move. So, Jay, come on from wherever you are. You're are you, you're skiing I, down the side of a mountain. You're on the <laughs> lake, or where where are you? Where are you? Yeah, I'm I, I'm I'm somewhere really exotic right now. I'm in Roachport. <laughs> um, but uh, so starting the starting the Thanksgiving break off early, but I didn't want to miss this. Uh, D Dave's not showing up on my screen. My you're not you. Oh, Dave, uh, D he's there. Is he there? Okay. Yeah, you're. You well, just probably have it on view. You, you're you're just getting your. You, you, we're, we're not seeing you on the bike though. Okay. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say, Dave. Even though I can't see you right now, man, it's great to see you. Totally miss you. Um, um, looking forward to when we can get back together, hang out again. And I love the paper. Whole time I was thinking, of course, about um, I'm more familiar with the later period, the 19th century, is thinking of Catherine Hall's um, study about the Baptist missionaries in Jamaica and makes a yeah. similar argument because, of course, these are really committed anti-slavery activists. But nonetheless, the, the, the sort of social control that they exert and the racial hierarchy that they implement in Jamaica is just central to their to their message and to their theology. So it, it seems like there's a, a long running story here. Um, I guess I had two, two really quick questions, though. Um, the first is about material interests. Um, and I'm thinking of the bicentennial of the abolition of the slave trade um, back in 2007. And it was a rather big deal when the General Synod and um, the Archbishop of Canterbury in those days, Rowan Williams, um, issued an apology uh, for the church's profits from the slave trade um, to the Caribbean. And I was just curious if that, if, if those the sort of the material interests play a, a role in your story and in your, in your thinkers here. Um, and then the second question, I mean, I really don't know a whole lot about the Anglican politics, but I know enough to know that Anglican politics is really, really messy and complex, especially in this period. And the people who, who studied it in the UK would always say that you know, the, the debates that we read, when we think that they're about one thing, they're actually about internal jockeying uh, within the Anglican hierarchy. Um, so I guess I wondered um, if, to what extent do the, um, does the questions about, um, you know, baptizing the enslaved peoples and the politics of slavery and anti-slavery, to what extent do they kind of map on the internal divisions within the uh, Anglican establishment? Okay, the um, the second question, which is the one I remember more. <laughs> the, the the Anglican politics certainly plays a role in this, and this is something I try to bring out in the story about um, about um, James Ramsey, because we we tend to start this story, um, Ramsey's story from seventeen um, eighty four when he publishes his um, anti um, his anti slavery. Well, his 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 two books on abolishing the slave trade and proposing a path to, to freedom. Um, but when you look at his correspondence with the Bishop of London in, um, while he was in St. Kitts, it tells a different story about somebody who is very much concerned about the, the, political, um, the political position that the, the Anglican church has in each colony. He's very um, sort of um, envious of the, 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 the power, the unlimited power of the planter class and the, there he has these, he relates these stories about the planters um, defiling the church, treat, using it as a polling station, which he didn't um, actually agree to. And on top of that, going on the altar and drinking, um, using the, the sacrament as libation and telling, reminding him when he protests that, you know, they, they paid for the church, they paid for the building, building the church, they paid the salary as, of the clergyman. So why you, you can't complain, we can do as we please. And this, then becomes interesting because 
after he leaves St. Kitts, he starts writing this, this, this anti-slavery stuff. And I, 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 I try to bring out how Im, you know, the impact that that experience in St. Kitts has on him, that he's not just frustrated with the conditions of slavery, he's also frustrated with the immense power that the planters had and the struggle of the church to try and tame this power, to assert itself as second in command in the colonies, second only to the crown, right? So th th there is a good deal of, of um, politics involved. The, the, there's also politics between the, 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 the different, um, between the Anglican church and the Protestant um, dissenters as they call them, the um, Methodists in particular. And there's a story in one of my chapters about George um, Whitefield who becomes um, a famous, um, he's an Anglican clergyman who becomes a Methodist is, is tutored by, the, um, by, by John Wesley and Charles Wesley, goes to Georgia several times and starts preaching to enslaved people outside the so-called walls of the church. And the, the, the response of the Anglican church to him is very aggressive. They, they um, do, don't like what he's doing, not only because he's, um, he's, 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 he's preaching to enslaved people, he's, he's preaching the, the Methodist doctrine rather than that of the Anglican church. So yes, the, the politics is there, but in addition to all of this politics, there is a big story about this concern that the, end, the, the church has for being the one that is most closely allied with the state, um, being the one to, 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 to give instruction to the enslaved people and, and baptize them because they, are, they feel they have the most, think, the most investment um, in the institution of slavery and in the maintenance of the colonies. So I, I, I don't shy away from the internal politics. I try to integrate that into the story I, I am telling. Um, the mat material interests, of course, the Anglican, the, 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 I'm, I'm very familiar with Catherine Hall's story. And in fact, the, the Andrew Porter, whom I mentioned, um, his book, Religion Versus Empire, it's largely a response to Catherine Hall. He, and, he, and he does, um, talk about her, her book and so on, because uh, he's trying to debunk the idea that they were promoting and more concerned with maintaining empire as opposed to spreading religion. Um, I'm not sold on, on, on Porter's take on this, this history, at, at least from my, um, my, my look at the Anglican church, because I'm not looking at the Baptists and the Methodists. Um, uh, I'm just focusing on the Anglican church and certainly the Anglican church had a strong interest in slavery and the, 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 the empire. They were owners of slaves, you know? They, they, they weren't like the Baptists who came in and, and, weren't, and, and didn't own slaves. So th they had even a, a, a far more direct interest in, in, in maintain, maintaining the institution, or, and at least in, in making sure any path proposed to freedom would not jeopardize the plantation system. I don't know if that answers it. It's still there, Jay. Did I answer your question, Jay? And yes, in, yes, thanks very much. He's in, he's in Rocheport, you know, I hear they're very demanding there. Well, yeah, he could have gone, he, maybe he's a couple, more, couple miles away now. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so I've got, I've got at least three more uh, uh, questions I see here. Uh, for, a student has volunteered, Mackenzie Tor. Could you please come up? Yes. Um, thanks is. so much, uh, Professor Dunkley. That was really interesting and very informative. Um, and I guess my question is, my familiarity with the SPG comes from actually one of my undergraduate professors, Ted Andrews. And he's published a book on uh, native and enslaved missionaries that work with the SPG in British North America. And so I'm wondering if we see enslaved missionaries in, uh, that work for the SPG in the Caribbean. And how do they, if so, how do they interact with the, or do they contest this kind of support of slavery that comes from the administrative kind of apparatus of the church? Um, or how do I guess, yeah, I guess how do they interact with it? interact with the with the church the, the yeah so so do they like contest the church's support of slavery at all um there, it, it, or... there, there, there were some um spg catechists who did question um slavery 
some of them wrote and said they're very um, concerned about the, the conduct of slavery. That's one thing. And some reflect, you know, re express regret about having this institution of slavery associated with, with, um, with, with the church. Um, um, but they were in the minority, yeah, uh, particularly in the, in the Caribbean setting. Um, the ones in, 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 um, in North America, like Lejeau, he, he decided that he was not going to question slavery. Um, he was going to go with um, the status quo because he realized that he would get more um, access to the enslaved people um, if he did that. At the same time, his, his, his reflections on other issues relating to the enslaved people are, are, are not suggesting in any strong way that he was um, it, it opposed to slavery or that he, 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 um, he was unwilling, he was willing to consider um, a, abolition. Um, and that some of the, is the issues I'm referring to inc um, um, include race, you know, and his description of, of, of Africans as being unable, simply unable because of their African ancestry to rise themselves up in, in the level of civilization, that slavery was a way for them to, to share. So it, if you look at their relationship with the planters in isolation, you, you, it's easy to develop the view that they were just going along with what the planters wanted them to do. But when you look at their, their own um, reflections on the, the enslaved people themselves, and especially when they, 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 start, they started resisting, especially when they talked about resistance, you get a different picture. You get the picture of somebody who is not thinking seriously about ending slavery, right? Um, the most I could say I could give them is that they were, think they were prepared to ignore it and, um, and, 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 and proceed with, with um, conversion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, what did I say? I gave Rachel Precus. She was actually had the first question, but I missed it. I was just curious about the the phrase in Thomas Bray's letter about the the spiritual entertainment. That I mean, that the idea seemed to be that by bringing, I mean it. <laughs> It, it, to a 21st century ear, it, it sounds like a yay diversity kind of statement. Yes, that's <laughs> what is, yeah. what yeah. does it mean by the spiritual entertainment? Like who's being entertained and is it entertainment like we think of today, like, like you know, music and theater and, and so on is, is entertainment or is it entertained in the sense of God entertaining, you know, the, the, the people's need to be, I don't know, you, you know, what do you, do you have a sense of what he meant by that phrase? In the context of what he was saying, it was purely a comment on, um, on, on, on the, you know, that it would please God that they were had successfully brought them into the church. Um, so it, I, 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 when I, when I first read it, I actually thought about some of those things that, you know, is this man saying that he, he's getting some African rhythm in the church, so he's actually happy. But um, what the, the context like something of the, an Episcopalian would say, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the context of his conversation was that God would be very pleased, you know, that they had successfully tamed these Africans and brought them into the light of the gospel, and 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 they were there. Um, they, 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 and and the idea that's being communicated in the whole thing is that this this was like a task which it's touch and go. It didn't have to succeed because we're dealing with Africans here who do not, you know, they don't, they lack on any conception of, of, of God, any, any, any conception of a, of a true deity and so on. So how do we get them to accept this Christian um, thinking and, and lifestyle? And, and so that's what he's, he's commenting on and he's using He's, he's making this argument um, through the using race. 
and he's saying race is what is is is, is accounting for any any resistance to Christianity that they might encounter. So this is going to please God if you can kind of redeem them from that racial backwardness and and get them into 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 the light into the, the light of God. I don't so know if entertainment that... is it mean, it is being used like you know, in the sense of entertaining emotion. I mean that kind of entertainment, not yes. Not like God's sensory pleasure in in um, yeah, not, not 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 like having a a, a party and um. no. See this, this, this <laughs> that sounds entertaining emotion. That sounds more Episcopal. That sounds more Anglican to me than the other kind. Yeah. Uh, 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 so Al Zercher Reichardt had a question. I love the way you say my name, Jeff. Oh, hi, Dave. you right? Uh, <laughs> it's close, is that? Yeah. I, I had a, I had a, a couple questions, Dave. Um, yeah. Though I think they're they're related to each other, and so the first one was, um, you know, bringing up your point about how this is so much about imperial security, um, and about thinking about things on these kind of broader scale. And so I was curious, in part, you know, if you could speak more to that. So where it fits in with say things like the Maroon Wars, um, if we see like a greater kind of do we see even just like pamphlets published more after that? Or is there more kind of discourse in moments of, of crisis in say in Jamaica or Barbados? Uh, but I was also more curious about where it fit in um, on a bigger scale. So are, are, are these SPG missionaries when they're talking about control in Jamaica and Barbados, are they alluding to um, you know, greater concerns in the Caribbean, what's happening with the French colonies, what's happening with the Spanish? Um, is there a kind of an inner imperial dimension to the security? Um, and then my second question is related uh, because this question of denominations is one that when I work with the SPG, when they do missionizing to indigenous peoples, um, their whole thing is, my goodness, we, be <laughs> we better convert better than the Catholics, but we also better convert better than those New England Congregationalists. And they see it as a security issue because Anglican converts, so the Mohawks and others, will be your safest allies who you can then use as diplomats for other indigenous groups. And so I, I'm curious where it fits in to a, a Caribbean and to a slave plantation um, uh, context, uh, in part because I'm curious, like what what is happening with other denominations? Like how easily can other missionaries actually get into these spaces? Because it's a lot easier, right, in native land for missionaries to kind of cycle through um, than it probably is in this island context. Um, all right. All right, that was a lot, but yeah, I was, I was curious about both. Okay, so the whenever. Uh, the, the Maroon Wars is something I'm actually looking into at the moment because they, I, I suspect that the um, the Anglican clergy in Jamaica they they started writing um, a lot more to the Bishop of London after the the, the Maroon Wars, but um, I got dis distracted by their uh, responses to the Taki um, uprising in in um, 1760 in Jamaica because that was. That was the, the largest uprising in the British um, Empire, colonial empire in the um, 18th, um, sorry, in the in the in the um, in the 18th century, yes. So and and after that you find these the, the clergymen, not the SPG in, um, special, because the SPG didn't really have a strong presence in Jamaica as such. It was the, the clergymen of the church itself. And you find them talking a lot more about my goodness, what we need to do, we need to extend our, our, our catechism to include the planters too, because they need to learn that if they continue practicing slavery in this, with these horrific measures, that, that, then the, the revolts are always gonna happen. Uh, so they are proposing amelioration uh, slavery. And, and this, okay, this amelioration yes. would then help with the pacification of the, the enslaved people alongside their Christianization. So there are, whenever there is there are moments of resistance, you find that they're thinking more about things like amelioration as part of the conversion process. The SPG was always concerned about the French, especially in the, in the and, and, and the Spanish too, in, especially in the context of North America. Um, they, they, I remember James, 
Thomas Bray getting involved with the colonization of Georgia for precisely that reason, to keep the as a buffer for the Spanish in, 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 in Florida, right? So that the, and that's part of the reason why he didn't want slavery there, because he didn't want them to be distracted by slavery. He wanted it sort of like a colony that will always be on guard against this foreign enemy rather than to be on guard against the enslaved population as well. Right. Of course, as I try to explain, none of this has to do with abolish, abolishing slavery. Yet, yet for some reason, people think that because he didn't support slavery in Georgia, it means that he was interested in abolishing slavery. He had other imperial interests, you know, imperial security interests that were uh, pressing weighing on his de his decisions. And these, you know, this comes out in his in involvement with um, Oglethorpe and and, and um, and Georgia, the the French, the Fr when when Thomas Bray first arrives in Maryland in 1699, the French were the the first people he wrote about was the French. He said, "My God, we have to do something because these Catholic priests they are going to convert the slaves and they are going to turn them against us." And the, the fear, and this is not just happening in. This is happening in North America as well as in the Caribbean as well, it, because the British were then going through the Eastern Caribbean and acquiring territory that were that was formerly French territory, um, and and the fear was that the French would promise the, the enslaved people baptism and freedom if they helped them to overcome British rule. So. A lot of this, this discussion that Bray himself then it has when he comes to North America is about how do we use conversion to protect the, col the colonies but, um, from the French. And um, this is how he gets royal patronage for his libraries from Queen Anne, for example. He tells her, look, you know, as flattering as, you know, Governor Nicholson was in naming um, and Annapolis after you and naming the, making it the capital. You know, the real thing he wants is that is, is investment for uh, to secure the colony against the French. So, um, yeah, so, so converting it, the enslaved people was very much a part of that story. Okay, uh, so Aaron. Hi. Um, so I really enjoyed this for many reasons as a historian of the Caribbean and somebody who spends a lot of time going through SPG stuff. Um, and I'm more familiar with it in Barbados and South Carolina, but I'm curious how much you found them kind of articulating exactly who their audience is. Um, because one of the things that I found in Barbados is that there seemed to be very little concern about the enslaved population and about preaching to them and a lot more about kind of the the moral failings of the planter class um and and that definitely i think is something that resonates in the the later abolitionists that you're talking about um and then i also had just to build on al's point because she made me think about um on top of where i was already going after listening to your talk which i really enjoyed um thinking about jorge canizares Escara's puritan conquistadors and whether there's a way to think about the SPG in that context. I know he's talking about the Catholics versus the Puritans and them taking a similar view towards um, kind of creating this, this religious empire as a way of shoring up imperial concerns. But I almost wonder if there's not value in putting the SPG into that discussion, especially during the early period that you were talking about. And then finally, just because I, I can't help myself, um, because I have looked at, the, the, at Codrington College a lot, um, one of the things that really struck me is that, you know, it continues today to be an Anglican theological seminary, and it's educating Black Barbadians who were not its primary audience um, when it was built in the 18th century. And so I'm curious about kind of the transition of who, of who they are talking to in the 19th century, so after 1830, because I know uh, Klingberg goes up to you know, the middle of the 18th century and then Bennett goes to the 1830s. But, you know, what comes after that? What comes after emancipation? So I'm wondering if you're planning, how far you're planning to go into the 19th century. So thank you again. Um, and yeah, I'll stop talking now. Gosh, Erin, I, I hope I can answer. 
um, all, all of that. So um, for, firstly, I know that you were very, um, you're very familiar with, with the um, Richard Ligon, mm -hmm. um, who happened to be a, a, an Anglican clergyman and one of the first clergymen to really write about, you know, we need to convert these enslaved people because, because they want conversion, but the planters then responded and said, look, if you convert them, you're gonna to have to free them, right? Because the British law say so you can't enslave uh, Christians, right? And Ligon then articulates what becomes the, the common line of the, the, the clergy that I'm not talking about in, you know, um, enslaving a Christian, I'm talking about Christianizing a slave, which is a different thing. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so um, that to me becomes, you know, sort of what the SPG is is trying to do. That they 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 and yes, you're right. They 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 wrote a lot more about the planters than they did about the enslaved people. That was that is part of the struggle I had. When I when I go to even Bray's um, work, because he he, he's, he wrote, wrote so much, overwhelmingly about how we can get these planters um, transformed into true Christians and so on, but I'm reading into that as well a concern about their conduct of slavery, mm -hmm. that because they 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 are they are not practicing Christians because they are not genuine Christian in, in in his eyes that they are not practicing Christian slavery. And that, that's why it becomes interesting to me that bishops back in London who are like Fleetwood were looking at this work that the SPG has done, are saying, looking at the bigger picture and saying that what is wrong with these practices? Don't they realize that if they adhere to what the SPG is saying, they, they can become the masters of the universe because they have Christian slaves. There's nothing more pleasing to God than a Christian slave, right? So, so yes, you're right. But um, I would say, don't get discouraged by all of that conversation because within that, there is, there is still this concern about slavery, even when it's, it's not you know, explicitly stated. Um, I, I think some, some people might call this reading against the grain. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I, I can totally see that as being reading against the grain. You can almost make an argument that the SPG is getting a jump on those 19th century um, folks who start talking about slavery as a not a necessary evil, but as a positive good and as a way of, of you know, bringing Christianity and spreading Anglicanism versus um, versus other religions. I, I think this is really interesting. Yeah. So, Codrington College. <laughs> no, I, 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 do, I don't know what happens to Codrington College in the 19th century. I know it becomes it becomes a big a bigger deal. It started as a training facility for um, catechists and so on, but um, and this was part of um, Codrington's will. He, he mm -hmm. actually wanted this college started because he himself was very much interested in divinity, but the training was supposed to was had no bearing on abolition. It was supposed to again help them to moralized slavery, having these people trained from the local population that would then be already familiar with the people there and, and can communicate with the planters at, a, at, a, at, at that level, right? Um, it it's, it's, it's not surprising to me that it's a prestigious college in Barbados today because I went to an Anglican, I went to several Anglican schools in Jamaica myself, and they're, they're all among the prestigious schools, right? Um, it's just the way history worked out, you know. Yes. Um, I, I think the church did a good job in, in, in investing in schooling in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the early years, especially during slavery, even though it was, ex, you know, white schooling, and then only Later on, they started accepting people of color into the into these schools. But because of the the, the, the history, the longer history of these schools, they developed um, um, better reputations than the newer schools. And of course, when they started getting black teachers, they actually Africanized the schools because the Anglican Church, like in Barbados, is not the Anglican Church in England. You know, it's not the Church of England. It's the, just like the Episcopal Church in the US is not the Church of England, you know? So it has been Africanized in the Caribbean context. And so too has the, the, the education that is being provided in these traditional 
um, Anglican schools. And that's why they, you know, they continue to have such, you know, prominence and so on. Um, they, I think, yeah, the SPG's concern about empire building, that to me is, is a for, it's actually a foregone conclusion because Bray writes about it all the time. He, he, he writes about the French, his main concern in the North American context is the French that he says, look, if, if we do not pay attention to the French, we you know, beat back Roman Catholicism, we are going to be in serious problems, especially when it starts to infiltrate the, the, the enslaved population. But he's also talking about the Roman Catholics not having the loyalty to the, the British crown, more loyalty mm -hmm. to the, the Pope and, and, and so on. And of course, he has he, some very unflattering comments about Roman Catholicism. I'm sure you're aware of the language, mm -hmm. call it Popish beliefs, false superstition and, and all of this. So I think that the religious, con the, um, the conversation about religious differences is very much part of what is fueling the, 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 the activities of the SPG. But the fear is that these religious differences would reverse the um, control of the English church in its colonies and by virtue of that, they control the colonies by England. So um, I think these architects of empire had a very, um, they, they, they gave the church um, a great deal of um, consideration in how they understood empire building. And realized that the church was not just sort of adjunct of the empire, but quite central to maintain, maintaining it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so is there, is there any, any, other, any other questions? Any other students? That was the last one I had in the queue. Um, if not, going once, going <laughs> going once, going twice. Uh, well, Dave, listen, thank. I, I, I realized I actually I actually kind of uh, forgot like just how many SBG fans there were. You know, it's a going. <laughs> <laughs> in, at least, at least in this crowd. So, 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 so. Uh, thank you very much for that the, that incredibly informative talk, and we'll look forward to to the rest to how the rest of the project develops. Uh, I'm lo I'm looking forward to forward to it more than you actually. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, you're yeah. probably looking forward to it. If you're like me, you're looking forward to being over someday. But oh um, man, someday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, but, but they never somehow, but they somehow never end. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, before, well, let's give Dave, let's give, let's 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 uh, uh, open up the channels and give Dave a hand. And uh, let me say, uh, two weeks from today. We'll